Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Yanis wafton I'm a staff engineer in VMware. And today, I'm going pre to present you compile time annotation processing. And uh, we'll try to have a brief introduction to Project Wombok. And also, I'm going to show you two custom annotation processors I wrote. Uh, sorry for my voice. I got sick overnight. So I'll tr try to do my best. The agenda for today is to start uh, with some theoretical background, what's annotation processing, and also to have some beginner introduction to Project Wombok and uh, what's the virus. Then we'll take a look under the hood and continue with uh, writing our own annotation processors, see how to do that and uh, what do we need in order to achieve our tasks. And I will have uh, live demos uh, in the last two parts. Uh, so, annotation processing has been around for quite a long time. It was standardized in Java 6, uh, which was in 2006. And the goal was to define a pluggable mechanism to uh, have a build time annotation processing, which can generate code. Um, that being a resource, a bytecode, or some new sources. Uh, and that needs to happen on compile level, uh, not at runtime. Um, to do that, you need to implement uh, a processor. The QR code should point you to the API documentations for that. Uh, but I'll show you the overview, how, how that's done. So we have three steps. First is to register the custom processors, uh, which defines what are the supported annotations by that, pr that processor. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we need to initialize our environment. After that, we have multiple rounds of uh, execution processing, where we pass the abstract syntax tree to different processors, which can do a bunch of things with that. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we, we run the processor multiple, uh, in multiple rounds until there's nothing else to do. And uh, once that's finished, we proceed to the compiling the bytecode, the, to bytecode, uh, which the Java C translates the abstract syntax tree into Java bytecode. I have one slide, what's an abstract syntax tree? This is how your text source code becomes a bytecode. The intermediate step is having a, an abstract syntax tree, which represents the source code in Java objects, which are linked together. Uh, and uh, they're from types that are understood by the Java compiler. So um, here's a very brief example uh, with some code blocks. Um, what we can do by modifying that is deleting some of the objects in the abstract syntax tree or adding new objects to the appropriate uh, places and linking them together. That way, we can uh, modify the end resulting bytecode. Annotation processing is used on, for many different tasks. Uh, here's a non-exhaustive list of things that can uh, benefit from uh, annotation processing. For example, RPC stubs, reflection stubs, dependency injection, or Google code generation. Or you can do something that you need, like we are going to show in the later slides. Some libraries that are using annotation processing, uh, Dagger is a very um, well-known example. It, it's used for dependency injection. Or the Google Auto, which is a collection of uh, automation uh, libraries that generate code, for example, for gRPC. And there's uh, a bunch of others, uh, but I'm going to take a deep look in the last one, Project Lombok or just one book. 
the official name is Project Wombok. And what they say is the goal is to have something that automates the getter and tickles methods. In my words, the main goal is to, if you have a code template, which is recurring on a hundreds or, or thousands of uh, times inside your code, you need to find a way to automate that because that's something that's hard to support by a human. And uh, one typical problem for that is having a data transfer object, a DTO. Uh, you have a simple class, you have the private members, they have their types, and then you need to, uh, to have hundreds of lines of Google code, which is get, set, make a constructor, write custom equals method that compares the virus, or also you need to override the cache uh, code method or two string and many more. While that's doable, the problem is that when you need to look into your code, uh, it's usually th that DTO is five, or, you know, five screens or three, four screens, no matter how, it's very long. And if you need to add a new member, you need to make the appropriate changes on multiple places inside your code uh, base. Um, also, uh, reordering uh, parameters inside the constructors can happen very easy. Uh, so it's a good idea to write your own builders, uh, which in, you know, have a builder pattern. I, I have slides on that later. And that's another class with another hundreds of lines of code, and someone needs to write it. Uh, modern uh, IDEs like IntelliJ can generate those methods for you. Uh, but if you need to modify, you need to be very careful and test everything. And uh, I can show you some examples of that later. So the solution, how I see it, is to have annotations on what we need to add as Google code. And that code segment on the screen, that's the same implementation on the previous slide. Uh, we, I've skipped only the imports. Uh, everything else is the same. And what Wombok is going to do, it's going to generate all the getters, setters, equals methods automatically. And it's going to do it in, on bytecode level. So you don't have a new runtime dependency uh, for your project. Uh, and it's going to be just as fast as if you wrote them on your own. Um, it's highly customizable. Uh, if you want to have, for example, a synchronized getter and setter method, you can write your own getter and setter method uh, and do the synchronization. And Wobok is not going to overwrite that. So. Um, the advantage is that if you have such a situation where you really need to have a synchronization, you can see that by just opening the file because it's going to pop out as a different pattern than the, all, all the other classes. It's not going to be obscured by 100 or 200 lines of code. Uh, one drawback with having Project Wombok is that uh, you need to have uh, an appropriate plugin installed to your IDE. The good news is that uh, Wombok provides native support for Eclipse, and also there's a very good plugin for IntelliJ. And also they support uh, a bunch of other uh, IDEs. The reason for that is that uh, the IDE, it's when you write, for example, get name, it works if uh, a method get name is defined in the source code. And because there's nothing uh, uh, such thing, uh, then it's going to not show up. But the code is going to compile because it's done all over the next over the compilation phase. Uh, this uh, new method is going to be created. Uh, and the plugins do that. They find those patterns and add uh, for the 
uh, add that options to the IDE. So maybe I can show you our first example, how you can write a getter and setter. Um, the text is uh, quite small on the right, but uh, let me explain. The one on the left is what you write on your ID. The one on the right is what you will get as if you wrote it yourself. Uh, Wombok has a COI tool. Uh, it has a main method, so you can call it as a standalone uh, Java applications. And it has a dwombok method, which if you have some code written in, uh, with Wombok annotations, it's going to parse it and remove all the, all the code, uh, all the annotations. And transfer that into a new source code file. Uh, that's maybe useful in some situations, uh, but I use that to show you the examples. So on the left, we annotated uh, the H member with getter and setter. And what we get on the right is uh, a newly generated source code for get H and set H. Also, uh, we transferred the um, Java doc into the two methods. So that's another advantage. You can write uh, the Java doc for your get and set method in the same comment uh, string, and it's going to be copied to two of them. So that way, you can uh, keep your documentation in sync uh, more easily. Uh, the second example I have is declaring a setter method which needs to be uh, package level protected, uh, access level protected, uh, and it's gonna generate a set name method down. Next annotation is uh, about uh, creating uh, constructors for your class. And here uh, we define a simple class on the top which has two annotations, no arcs constructor and all arcs constructor. And that will be transferred into, uh, that will generate two, two different methods, uh, constructor methods, uh, which you can then use. Uh, on the right, uh, I'm showing you another example. Uh, you can have uh, parameters passed to the uh, annotations where you can generate a static uh, method which will uh, act as in, uh, instantiator or a factory method for creating the new instance. Uh, that's useful in many cases. Uh, many of the annotations support many different parameters. Uh, this is just a, a brief introduction to the library and how it can help you. Many times we have mandatory parameters that sh should not be null. And uh, Wombok provides you a way to quickly check that at runtime uh, by adding a non-null uh, annotation to them. That makes them mandatory. And in all code snippets uh, on the right, you can see that we check if the value is null, then we throw a null pointer exception uh, with, with the, the argument that was null. Uh, also, uh, we can have a required arcs constructor annotation, which will generate a constructor only for uh, with getting those uh, values that are mandatory for our DTO object. Many times in your walks, you find person is some address. And that's because you haven't overwrote uh, the toString method. And while that's kind of easy, uh, keeping that in sync over time, if there are many modifications to the code base, uh, proves to be quite difficult. Many times you find that you're missing the parameter you want because someone forgot to modify the toString method. And Wombok can generate that method for you automatically. Uh, and also, it has the ability to exclude some fields that are sensitive. For example, credentials, passwords. Uh, that's an attack vector uh, for many applications uh, where the developer forgot to exclude from the logs the passwords. And then you can get root access 
uh, to some device. Uh, that's automatically done. And talking about works, many times you need to define your private static final variable for logging. And you can do that with a single annotation in the framework you want. Um, if you use, for example, SOF4J, uh, then uh, you annotate with at SOF4J your class and you have that variable. And then you can just try to walk the book or walk in for whatever level you want. Talking about the constructors, they're very evil because you can easily reorder them. And that can uh, happen without the intent or due to cultural difference. One example is if you have a first name and last name, uh, in many uh, countries, for example, Hungary and Russia, uh, people always write the family name first, the last name, and then the, the first name. So for a developer from Hungary to become natural to pass the parameters in a different order than we are going to do that. And uh, for, for that, it's better to use builder patterns where you create a builder, you set the different options, and when you execute the build, it's gonna create the object uh, by calling the, right construct the constructor in the right order. Uh, also, we support, uh, the one box supports uh, singular annotation, which makes filling in uh, collections with static data for unit tests very easy. Instead of first creating an object with, for example, attendees in our situation, uh, in our example here, uh, we can have multiple attendees and it's going to add them into a collection. Uh, that's very useful for uh, uh, unit tests. We still have the attendees and we can pass an external object if you want. And one final uh, slide on how to use uh, Project One Book. Uh, it defines two types of data, mutable, which can be annotated with the da data, and uh, this is equal to adding getter setter to string equals and hash code and required arcs constructor. So the example in the beginning, it was very, sh we had a lot of annotations, we can replace most of them with just a single one. Or if we want to have immutable data and we add, add value, then we are going to make all the fields private and final. So, uh, and we won't have any set methods. Uh, one box has one nice uh, feature, which is uh, if you create a builder, you can enable the, the two builder feature uh, by enabling it as a parameter. That way you can mutate immutable data by creating a new object instance. And uh, instead of calling the constructor with a bunch of getters, uh, Wombok is going to read all the data from the uh, old object. It's going to uh, set it as uh, temporary variables inside the builder. So um, I don't know if you see it uh, in the example uh, to builder. This will create a builder, it, uh, which is an object of type builder. It will copy the data and then we can mutate some fields inside the builder. So when we say the build method, it's gonna create a new object instance that has variables changed compared to the first one. Uh, it's not changing the data inside the first object, it's just creating a new. So that was the easy part. How does it work? From here on, we need to take deeper on uh, how, how that's happening. We have access to the abstract syntax tree. So the one book uh, annotation processor is called for different annotations and it has handlers, annotation handlers, which delete the annotations uh, from the abstract syntax tree and replace them with new AST elements, abstract syntax tree elements inside the tree. And that's done in multiple rounds. 
And once we finish processing, the Java compiler is going to take this abstract syntax tree and generate bytecode or just instructions. So here's our first question part. Do we have anything about Wombok? Or we can continue with the advanced topics. OK, no questions. So if you want to write your own annotation processor, you need to implement the processor interface. And you need to, uh, uh, to have a way for calling that. Uh, you can uh, specify that uh, into the Java C. Uh, there's a uh, command line argument for that. Or you can uh, add it to MetaInf services uh, and list all your uh, processors. That way, uh, the Java compiler is going to detect those and automatically load them, initialize them. To save some time, there are two, a couple of tricks. First, you only need to extend abstract processor. Uh, it has a lot of uh, predefined uh, implementation specific uh, tasks. And also, you can use uh, Google Auto Service Library, which has its own annotation processor that will generate the source file in MetaInf and add your annotation processors in your jar, in, in your compile jar. And one tip I have for you, if you really want to create your custom processor, you can use Maven Debug uh, and create, add your backpoints to your IntelliJ, for example. Uh, I'm going to show that uh, in a couple of minutes. By doing so, we can have remote debugging and debug our code and uh, uh, see uh, how the ST is built and uh, what, how we can extract the data and modify the data we want. So first, we need to find a problem worth solving. And in many applications, we have backend and frontend. They're developed by different teams. And usually, they're developed in completely different languages. For example, uh, TypeScript and Angular 2 and uh, Java in the back end. And if you need to change your contract uh, in Java then and change some parameter uh, or member, it's, you are going to probably break the UI. And you are going to detect that. Uh, on the right most when you run the application tests, or even worse, when customer calls and says there's a problem. So to be efficient, we need to have a better way of handling that. And because we as a developer, we usually have the same shared code base, we, can, we have a common build process, for example, Maven, uh, where we subsequently call first compiling the backend and then compiling the frontend. And if we can transfer some files or generate some files from compiling the backend that can be used when we uh, compile the frontend, we can detect um, uh, things that are not in sync uh, right at that step when we compile our project, which is uh, much, much better than uh, finding that after hours, we submitted our code to the Git repository. And the two uh, examples I have are based on that uh, concept. First one is a simple read-only processor, uh, where we had a DTO object, and we wanted to translate that into TypeScript. Uh, we started doing some sc uh, scripts in Python, I think. Uh, but then there's uh, the different regular expressions and transfers. And at that point, I've spent three hours to write a simple annotation processor, which has well, we offload or outsource the work of reading the Java source file to the Java compiler, which knows how to do that better than anyone else. 
and then we have the custom annotation processor which will generate a TypeScript file, which is an export interface, which can be then input, uh, uh, used as an input inside the TypeScript compilation phase. Uh, to do that, we need to define first on top our custom annotation with some uh, parameters we want. For example, the target path, we are going to use that. Uh, we also need to have a custom processor which extends the abstract processor, the second piece, uh, the second class. We define supported annotation types which that particular processor is gonna um, work with. So the Java compiler is only gonna pass those, um, those, those annotations to that. And uh, auto service is Google auto service annotations. All the classes that have this, it's gonna be added as a service file. And we have some, on the, the third class is a simple data we are going to test on. And that's how you can use it. Next step is to implement the process method, uh, which gets the different elements from the abstract syntax tree. And then, if it's a class, we apply a custom tree translator method. Uh, the translator interface implementation. Uh, I'm gonna show you how it works. That's the basic uh, uh, theory we have to for today. So I'm gonna go to live code demo now. Any questions until you now? If you want something else. Is it okay? So that's the second one. Is it okay or no? Okay. So I'll try, try to work with that. Uh, so we have the init method, which is defined in the processor. This is how you initialize your environment. And uh, we get the AS3, the AST uh, object that's gonna hold the abstract syntax tree. Uh, we can print uh, some uh, messages here. I've added those for debugging purposes uh, for the demo. Uh, when we call uh, the process method, is called at least once, even there, if there's nothing else to be processed. Uh, that's an implementation detail that uh, people need to know uh, if they go in writing their own annotation processor. Uh, and the idea is if you want to have some finisher uh, code uh, when you finish and there's nothing else to, proce to process to be able to do so. Uh, but uh, in our case, if the processing is over, we just return false and do nothing. Uh, but if there's something to process, we get all the elements that are annotated with a particular annotation. We translate into internal types, the type element. Uh, I haven't went into big, uh, into deeper look into the different element types because uh, it's very heavy and we can have a separate session on that topic. Uh, I'm just, I just want to show you some examples uh, how you can write one on your own. So I'm gonna break, add a break uh, back point here. Okay, and I've started, uh, uh, sorry, I'm in extended screen. We had issues before. So I've, stayed, I've started Maven debug uh, for one project. 
and uh, we need to connect from the IntelliJ as a remote debugger. You can easily that, uh, do that by adding a new remote debugging instance and specifying the port you want. I already did that, so I'm just going to run as debug. So let's start the debugger. Okay. It compiled and now it worded. We are now processing one of the files, the example source files I did. Uh, we have a simple name and age, which we want to translate. So, here, is it okay? Uh, here are the, the vocal, uh, the, the abstract syntax tree. So um, if we go down the, in the code, we can get the full tree as a variable by using the element. And it has a lot of processing power. Uh, but as I said, we are only going to take a look inside when we declare a class member, a variable, we, have, uh, we can add a second breakpoint here in visit vardef uh, method to see how we can extract uh, the, var uh, the variable name. Uh, in our case, uh, as I've shown you the example code, sorry about that. We have a string, uh, a variable with name, name, sorry, and uh, type string. So by translating those, We, we can say, uh, we can see that the variable class name, or better here, is Java one string, and if we translate that to TypeScript class name, it's gonna be a string. And we run that once again for the H, and we will translate private A into H. into type int. Then we are going to write to a file. So let me open. Uh, so here's, uh, we are going to have the end result here. So let's just step over that. and it generated the source code for us. Uh, oh, sorry. That's the simple example. Uh, I also did one which is more complex, which has uh, generics, collections, maps, and, and arrays. And uh, we parsed that more or less the same with uh, some code branching. And in order to save time, I can just skip those breakpoints and, okay, maybe I need to skip that one. Uh, 
So here is how it's going to look for the more complex example. And that way, uh, we synchronize between the two applications uh, and translate the Java code to the TypeScript code. And the different teams are happy. The second example for a rotation processor is much more uh, detailed and, uh, and is much bigger source code. Uh, so the problem we were having was uh, that when you change a method name or a method signature in your REST API, there's no easy way to detect that that happened um, until there's some incompatibility. So what I did was to uh, uh, also we, we, we already were using uh, Swagger annotations where you can annotate uh, your different rest endpoints and explain what they're going to do in your documentation. Uh, the problem we were seeing was that in order to generate the Swagger docs, you need to run your controllers and for that you need to mock most of your applications. With, uh, so we had applications which were heavily mocked and they had different versions and uh, they were very incompatible uh, and very fragile to run because they required a lot of memory in order to initialize. So I was looking if there's a way to generate your documentation at compile time instead of at runtime. And uh, we found that one possibility is to just start reading the different annotations and uh, generate the required instructions on our own. So in our example, here, I created a processor that will uh, support all annotations, but then it's gonna match for particular annotations uh, it's interested in. And it, if uh, there are no such elements, it's just gonna skip and, and uh, not do anything. So our init method, again, we prepare our Swagger doc, and our process method uh, has more or less the same signature as before, but it has different implementations. And that way, we really need to understand how we map the different annotations in Swagger, and what are, is their meaning, and how to build our Swagger doc uh, using different annotations from different uh, packages. For example, request mapping, that's from Spring framework. And API operation is from Swagger. So uh, deprecated is standard Java. Uh, and uh, that's time consuming and very application specific. Uh, but the end goal was to save uh, time for the developers to understand that they did something wrong. So, uh, here I'm building uh, an operation for the Swagger docs, uh, reading, for example, the, the path for a request mapping. Uh, just sorry. Uh, for example, here uh, consumes uh, request mapping. Uh, it, it it has it, it's an annotation interface, and it has the different methods. So if you get the object instance that holds the definition, you can directly call the Java method and get the parameters it was uh, started with. So for example, if you, uh, if you want to get the path uh, that a particular um, REST request mapping is uh, gonna be called from, um, 
sorry. Uh, it, the text is small. Uh, I, I'll find it uh, a bit later. And uh, now, instead of modifying and reading the uh, syntax tree, we can find the appropriate elements and how they are annotated with. So we can build our end result. I want to save some time uh, here. So I, I won't go over all the code. Uh, um, I've tried to not do any modifications of the AST today because it's very heavy and uh, you can do a lot of things uh, with that, but uh, it's, the goal is to have just an introduction on that. Uh, do you have any questions uh, or do you want me to show something how it's done? Sorry, just a second to get the mic. Do you have access to the comments in the abstract syntax tree? Can you use those? Yes, you can. Uh, as I've shown it, Wombok, Wombok has access to those. Uh, and it uses it to generate the Java doc um, with that. And it can copy comments between the different, uh, from member to uh, generated source code uh, methods. We have some more time, so if you want me to answer something more, or if you want me to show something more on the code here. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, so going back a little bit uh, with the basic connotations that you showed us, how to put on the classes to generate the getters, the setters, constructors, and so on. Uh, I assume it's possible to set at least some of them on some interface that is actually implemented by specific classes, like DTOs or entity classes, maybe. Is that supported? Uh, yes, it's supported, uh, but... Uh, so, sorry, I, I think I've missed the question. Can you repeat it? Yeah, uh, we have a bit weird case, that's why I'm asking it this way, but uh, the thing is, we have some interfaces that are uh, we use for many actually DTOs or entity definitions. And then we use some custom code generation, so I was wondering if we can actually combine both Lombok and uh, So, uh, for example, you have uh, a class that extends a base class, and the base class, if it uses Lombok mm -hmm. to generate the code, uh, then during compilation, you are going to, uh, the Lombok is gonna generate bytecode to the main, uh, to the base class. So all, it's, uh, uh, all the classes that extend that are also going to have those methods. Mm -hmm. So it works. Okay, uh, but only with uh, superclass. Uh, for example, is it possible to use the same interface for several DTO classes, but this uh, interface to use the notation to construct always the all arguments constructor, for example? I mean, obviously, the interface cannot know about the concrete uh, properties. May, maybe we can write that okay, afterwards, yes. uh, just mm -hmm. with code. Uh, I think it will work, but yep. just okay. make to be sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. If you want, I have some examples on uh, Wombok and how that works. That was more advanced. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, thank you for your time.